Now, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Kenneth Koo, Group Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Tai Chong Chang Steamship Company in Hong Kong and a very good friend of USC Viterbi. Kenneth took over the reins of his family shipping business in 2005 after 22 years in the business of ship owning and ship management. Representing the, generation, the third generation of a 90 years old family shipping enterprise with roots in Shanghai, Kenneth joined the family business in 1983 after of obtaining his BA degree from the University of San Diego. Training under the watchful eyes of his shipping icon father, KH and uncle KW, Kenneth spent the first 18 years of his shipping career looking after the technical management as well as the naming, I'm sorry, the manning and training of his family shipping enterprises fleet. In 1992, he may have been the first ship owner to raise the issue of the critical role that ballast rank tank coatings plays in the safety construction of a vessel. He was instrumental in creating and leading a working group within the Hong Kong Ship Owner Association to draw up and publish a set of guidelines for the selection and application of such coatings back in 1995. Kenneth worked to drive several endeavors that look to unite Asian ship owners to demonstrate their substantial presence on the world shipping markets. Most notable of these endeavors included the collaboration with Intertanko in founding the organization's Asian Regional Forum in 1998. On the home from in Hong Kong, Kenneth is currently the chairman of the HK of the Hong Kong Ship Owners Association and a member of the quasi-government Maritime Industry Council. His dedication to seafarers is reflected in his seat on the Hong Kong General Committee of the Sailors Home and Mission to Seamen and he's been appointed chairman of Port Welfare Committee of Marine Departmental, HKSAR. More than that, Kenneth Koo is a Viterbi parent. His son, Eddie, graduated from, with a degree in chemical engineering and a master's in engineering management. His daughter is gra graduated today, uh, his daughter, uh, Ellen, with a bachelor's degree in industrial systems engineering, and she, she's on the way of getting her engineering management master's degree as well. So ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Kenneth Koo. Ladies and gentlemen, I can now finally say, fellow Trojans, uh, I think my association, let's say around 10 years ago, went about as far as the two letters of my alma mater, which is US, and the team name, which starts with a T. And um, as Dean Yorsels mentioned, I'm today the proud father of two USC Viterbi graduates, and I'm looking forward uh, to interact with both the school and yourselves in the future. Um, you know, when Dean Yorsels went through his kind introduction for me, I was kind of holding my breath and scanning the audience. Um, one thing he did not mention I don't know, maybe you did. Uh, I'm a liberal arts graduate. <laughs> so you guys are probably thinking, hmm, so here's a liberal arts undergrad addressing us. You know, hello, Dean Yortzels. Yeah, but believe me, 35 years ago, I was asking myself this same question, that exact same question. What's a liberal arts undergrad like me doing in the world of maritime transport, ships, and marine engineering. I am not an engineer. I did not aspire to be an engineer. I did not have the grades to be an engineer. I'm a liberal arts guy with my sights set towards a career in sports journalism. I'm a writer. But here I am giving a commencement speech to the fraternity of the best and the brightest in the field of engineering, not only in the US, but in the world. Almost 35 years ago, I went from zeroing in on a dream job offer with the LA Times, covering basketball and football in the California Interscholastic Federation. That's the CIF for those of you who may not be that familiar, which covers the, uh, all the high schools all over the state of California, with visions 
of one day doing exclusives with the megastars of the NBA and the NFL. Well, I went from that to the engine room of a 110,000 deadweight tons dry cargo carrier, all in a blink of an eye. I went from scouring box scores and play-by-plays to scouring Pmax data, specific consumption figures, and machinery running hours. I knew what to do with the former. The latter was, with apologies to Dean Yortzos, <laughs> Greek to me. You know, I was way, way, way out of my depth, not like you guys. But I found a way to survive and then to thrive. Today, I wish to take this opportunity to share with you my path from writer to learning the nuts and bolts of marine engineering to helming a shipping business running a fleet of dry cargo ships and car crude oil carriers transporting almost 10 million tons of cargo a year to every corner of the globe. This is pretty bizarre. You guys must still be thinking. And it certainly is. So let me start from the beginning. In January of 1983, I was itching to graduate from college and start my dream job as a sports journalist with the LA Times. And back then, the Lakers were gearing up for a championship against the 76ers. USC women's basketball was contending for the NCAA championship against Louisiana Tech, and the Super Bowl was just around the corner. But the most exciting thing was that one day, I was going to cover these sporting events. They were all mine, at least that's what I felt. However, fate had other plans. I was persuaded by my family to drop everything and return to Hong Kong to learn the ropes of our family shipping business that turns 99 years old this year. As the only son, I didn't have much of a choice but to assume my obligations. My late father ran the commercial and financial side of things, while my uncle ran our fleet technical management. Like any successor of a family business, my mandate was to start off learning about the assets, our fleet. I learned under my uncle's feet, but only for my first seven years. He tragically passed away in 1991, leaving me to take up the reins of technical management of the fleet. Being a traditional, with all due respect to my predecessing uh, generations, mom and pop store type of business, I had a team of ex-marine engineers and ex-master mariners who are experienced beyond doubt, but just didn't have the leadership nor the organizational abilities to carry on. So they looked to me, the writer, the sports journalist, to lead. From 1991 to 2004, as my father carried out his vision for company expansion, our fleet of dry cargo carriers and crude oil carriers grew from six vessels to 22, or from a deadweight tonnage of 290,000 tons to over two and a half million tons. I had to do it all, leading and managing new vessel construction, in-water fleet management, compliance, training, dry docking, maintenance, the works. Yep, and here I was, the writer. To say my learning curve in maritime or marine engineering was steep is an over-the-top understatement if there ever was one. How I overcame this was based on always thinking as a writer. Writing is an art, just like what Dean Yorso's talked about, you're having a canvas to paint on you know, as, you, as you progress in your careers. Just like an artist will craft and sculpt your ideas into tangible forms to express these ideas, as a writer, I do the same thing. A good writer thinks like an artist so that what is written conveys his or her ideas into tangible themes to garner interest and create inspiration for the reader. As a sports journalist, I start off with an idea or theme, back, back them with tangible statistics, and conclude with a viewpoint that I believe in and which I hope will inspire the reader. I adopted this mindset as I confronted the challenges of learning technical management for our fleet. I had to think like a writer. Only my, ta my target audience was myself. Through learning the nitty-gritty of ma marine engineering, I endeavored to craft the story of marine engineering. 
a discipline and profession like all other forms of engineering which you have all worked so hard and endeavored into, which is steeped in methodology, procedures, processes, and quantification. A discipline and profession that depends criti critically upon tangible data and evidence. I had to educate myself and make myself interested and inspired in the field of marine engineering. After all, that's a writer's ultimate goal, to interest and ultimately inspire the reader. The reader, though, was also me. It worked. Marine engineering actually started to grow on me. But make no mistake, trying to be interested and inspired was very, very daunting. After all, I am not an engineer, but I did have two more things up my sleeve which continually drove me. I had pride, I had passion. I also had an artist's eye when I looked at my ships. To me, ships are simply beautiful from an aesthetic sense. And because I knew they were going to be mine one day, there was life in them also as well. And what further fueled my pride and passion? And that further fueled my pride and passion. So armed with these simplest of rock and flint tools that have nothing to do with engineering, I started off my shipping career as a technical director for fleet management. But I still needed to learn the nitty gritty of marine engineering, learning on the run while managing the fleet to ensure my father's business strategy of fleet expansion will be realized. So first off, I needed a topic, a headline to focus myself. And what better topic then what makes a ship transport over 100,000 tons of cargo from point A to point B? To answer that question, I struggle to understand what physically moved the ship. What made a marine diesel engine, the prime mover, the power plant, move a ship? I learned enough to be able to envision a marine diesel engine moving a ship through a concert and team of components that collaborates, coordinates, and cooperates to achieve this. There is the shafting system that powers the propeller, the fuel oil system that feeds the power plant, the turbocharging system that increases internal combustion efficiency and power output, the cooling system that ensures, in a nutshell, that the hottest part of the engine is cool, the pneumatic system that ensures the starting and maneuvering of the main engine, as well as the safety devices, are working safely and efficiently. Not a big difference, actually, from, for example, an NBA team like the Showtime Lakers back in the day, actually back in my day. The bus family's teams of those days won championship galores, navigating the Lakers from good to great to legendary status because Magic Johnson in initiated, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar anchored, and James Worthy finished. But they were able to do this because of a system that included management staff, coaching staff, the trainers, the equipment managers, and I'm talking about the Lakers, not the Clippers, and the scouts. Like the machinery systems on board a ship, the Lakers components and systems aligns, powers, lubricates, heats up, and cools down the team to enable the team to navigate towards prescribed performance goals. Being able to envision and then understand how a machinery system works enabled me to grasp, at least on a fundamental level, how the individual pieces of machinery works to contribute into the functioning of the system as a whole. But I needed to get deeper into this. My ongoing work in writing a story of marine engineering is crossing into the field of investigative journalism. During my sports journalism days, I was obsessed with statistics. Everything from field goal percentages, rebounds, player efficiency ratings. I believe stats tell a story. And this obsession of mine in stats helped me tremendously as I dove further into investigating how machinery and machinery systems worked. I came to understand for marine fuel oil, which is basically refined residues from crude oil, trash, to power a marine diesel engine, the fuel oil must be heated to a certain viscosity and purified to rid harmful abrasive residues before being transferred by fuel pump into the combustion chamber of the engine. 
I understood that turbocharging system increases an internal combustion engine's efficiency and power output by forcing extra air into, combustion into the combustion chamber because the turbine can force more air and proportionately more fuel into the combustion chamber than atmospheric pressure alone. I understood that control air system comes from air compressors compressing atmospheric air pressure to the pressure bar that starts the marine diesel engine and enables the engine to respond to different helm orders. From these basic understandings, I was able to gain a firmer fundamental grasp on the how, which was relatively straightforward. Straightforward, <laughs> but not easy. After all, I am not that marine engineer. The hard part was understanding why all this worked. Why do all these bells and whistles move a ship from point A to point B? Now, this is where the writer in me came into play to enable me to further visualize on the why in a less daunting way so that I'm not blown away by all the technical stuff. I tried to figure out why machinery systems work by envisioning two different points of view. None of it, again, related to engineering. One is from a sports journalist's point of view. I know that field goal percentages are affected by the number of assists. The more of the former, the better. The number of points from fast breaks, again, the more of the former, the better. Or the more of the latter, the better, I should say. The number of turnovers, the less, the better. And rebounds, again, you want to dominate the glass. Similarly, the two most critical and fundamental performance indicators for a marine diesel engine on board a ship is to move the ship efficiently and safely are to ensure that fuel oil consumption, the lower the better, and speed, the higher the better. These are predicated upon the cooling systems, lubricating systems, turbocharging systems, heating systems, and control air systems, all doing their part and playing their roles. Just like the point guards, shooting guards, shooting forwards, power forwards, and centers doing their job and helping the team win. I also adopted the viewpoint of a symphony conductor by envisioning that the engine room of a ship and its myriad of machinery as a symphony orchestra. The main engine, the auxiliary engines, heaters, coolers, evaporators, etc., are the violins, cellos, trumpets of the orchestra. Each instrument has its own characteristics, but must be played in harmony with the others. I applied the same vision to machinery systems. Cooling systems ensure that exhaust outlet temperatures remain within operating parameters. Fuel oil systems ensure pro proper viscosity of fuel oil pumped into the main auxiliary machineries, so on and so forth. This particular symphony of machinery must play in harmony. If this symphony plays out a tune, this means machinery systems are not properly cooled. Fuel oil not properly heated and purified, shafting systems not properly aligned, turbocharging systems not forcing air at proper pressure bars. An out-of-tune symphony can elicit boos and hisses from the audience. An out-of-tune machinery system can mean a ship that floats and a ship that sinks. I started to associate the flats and sharps and majors and minors of musical instrument sheets to the inlet and outlet temperatures, peak cylinder compression pre pressures, viscosity, etc., of performance specifications. Each of these performance parameters, if met, will ensure that the entire machinery system literally hums in concert. And believe me, after years on board different ships in our fleet, a perfectly running set of machines and machinery systems is music to my ears. Just as a perfectly conducted symphony brings pleasure and serenity to the listener, a perfectly conducted set of machines and machinery systems brings calm, confidence, and safety to a ship navigating from point A to point B. For those of you who are Bruce Lee movie buffs, like me, you may remember his immortal remarks in the movie, his last one actually, Enter the Dragon. It's like a finger pointing to the moon. Do not look at the finger or you will miss all its heavenly glory. In other words, focus on the macro. Look from a lateral perspective. 
Think of the peripherals, all that will enable you to look beyond the tangible endpoint and gain a multifaceted, multi-angled, multi-dimensional understanding of a tangible matter at hand. Note that I don't use finite terms such as conclusion, result, solution, you know, things that you yourselves are very much used to uh, during your uh, academic endeavors here. I don't do that because I believe nothing is ever an end-all conclusion, result, or even a solution. Instead, each level of understanding nurtures new insights that allow you to reach a next level of, under level of understanding and the next level of insight. This is an exercise of envisioning which will enable you to grow and mature from both a professional and a personal perspective. The finger that points you, ladies and gentlemen, is towards not a fixed path forward. You walk out of Galen Center on a springboard, a trampoline that will propel you towards unlimited directions and unlimited heights. You start your journey into a world that is dynamic, a constantly changing and evolving world that needs a dynamism and embracing of change for you to tackle it successfully. After all, change is the only constant of nature. Today, I continue to apply my sports journalism training into running my company, envisioning, thinking laterally, forging the intangibles of aptitude, attitude, character, and core values into the links that connect the tangibles for, in my business, and in my case, machinery and machinery system design outfitting and performance parameters. Learning that these intangibles and tangibles are interactive and interdependent. From that realization, I'm able to reach new dynamics, new perspectives, and new philosophies on how to manage in a dynamic and multifaceted way. I'm able to identify a management vision, a management philosophy, and a management strategy that allows for a company to develop evolve, and hopefully perpetuate. Envisioning also allows me to inspire and motivate my staff, as well as myself, continuously, to point them and myself towards my staff's own career path development, and as well as my own personal growth as a human being. Finally, more than three decades after my rather traumatic transition from sports journalism to shipping, Pride and passion are still the driving force as well as the anchor and the bedrock of all my business and professional endeavors. Pride and passion makes a writer write what him or her believes in and stand up for these beliefs. As an entrepreneur, these core values holds true for me. You will all receive your postgraduate diplomas today. Make sure, make doubly sure that you walk out with pride and passion in all that you've achieved, in all that you believe in, and in all that you envision. Believe me, they will be the primary driving force as you reach for the stars in the many, many years ahead of you. You have these potentials, qualities, and strengths within all of you. I promise you that. Today, you are all moving on towards your own aspirations and dreams, so much more better equipped than I ever hoped to be 35 years ago when I stepped on board that 110,000 deadweight tons dry cargo carrier. Your springboard is far stronger, your foundation far more robust. Now feel this with your pride and your passion. I promise you, your futures are limitless. Now take your diplomas and head out to craft and write your own story. I'm sure it will make headlines in a very, very big way for all of you. Thank you. Thank you.